Hey, everyone, uh, as more folks continue to file in, just hit chat and let us know where you are observing from today and joining in the conversation from today. Uh, I, I say it all time and again, but this really is uh, almost more about all of you than it is about any of the content here. So just say hi to all your friends around the food industry. And if you see anything interesting happening near you, uh, just you know, share it and uh, let's do it together as a group. So I thought this was an interesting news story with all the crazy, um, often negative things happening in the world. Like this seems to be like the cherry on the uh, depressing Sunday. <laughs> Shark Kano. NASA satellite images capture a plume of discolored water emitting from the Kabachi volcano where mutant sharks live in an acidic underwater crater. <laughs> so we have uh, mutant volcanic sharks now that we have to worry about <laughs> as well. Uh, it's amazing. I mean, I think this is true, <laughs> right? So think of how hot that water must be and they've somehow have adapted to, to do this. <laughs> But look, between this and like, I don't know, like monkey pox, all of a sudden, I mean, it's pretty nuts. Uh, <laughs> I feel like that word pox is just really, uh, it's a scary word, isn't it? Yeah, definitely. Like, you can put almost any word before the word <laughs> pox and it becomes scary. <laughs> it actually modifies any delightful word into a scary word. Like monkeys are great, but as soon as you put a pox next to it, it becomes terrifying. <laughs> Uh, I <clears throat> like think of this. You can you can take a, a word we all like, like I don't know, taco. If you had taco pox, <laughs> it becomes scary all of a sudden, right? So uh, we're dealing with monkey pox. We'll see where that goes, but I think we still don't know that much about it. The one thing I saw is that it's a uh, um, uh, like a double stranded DNA thing, as opposed to the RNA, single stranded RNA of COVID. So it may not be able to aerosolize nearly as well. So it might have to be, you know, close contact or something else that would spread it. And it's not going to be hyper transmissible the way we've seen with COVID and some of its later variants. But uh, we'll see. Just that pox thing scares me. Uh, and then I saw this study as well. I'd like to get your take. So this was actually from last year, but I think they've done some updates to it that just got republished. They looked at how much people spend and whether they overspend and found that people that use uh, contactless pay, which has spiked considerably as a result of the pandemic, because people didn't want to touch cards and, and all that, that they are something like 34% more likely to overspend. Hmm. I think that feels right, right? Because when you, I mean, do you guys use your, your phone to pay? Mm -hmm. I love it. Yeah, I also have like my card saved on my phone mm -hmm. and it's like play money. I could just buy stuff with it instantly. Yeah. <laughs> when you does it does it doesn't it almost feel like you're not spending money when you pay with your phone? <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I, I get that feeling. I'm like, yeah, okay, just tapping my phone. It doesn't feel <laughs> as much like money's being taken out of my account for some reason. There's something that's not as visceral about it. It's just so easy. It's almost like um like the first time you took an Uber or something and you were able to just get out of the car, right? It just, uh, so I think there's probably something to this. So if we have, let's say inflationary pressure that's gonna, um, uh, you know, put pressure on, on consumer spending, let's say. I wonder if continued increased adoption and contactless pay will sort of work in the opposite direction and sort of cancel some of that stuff out potentially. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it's definitely true. I don't know if you use Apple Pay on your computer, where if you have an Apple Watch on, you just double click the watch and it, like automatically approves the payment like that. I, the, the, if I had a shopping cart that I would have abandoned previously, now like I just buy it because it's way too easy. Yeah, it's just wait. Look, we're like yeah. back when Amazon introduced like you know uh, one click uh, mm -hmm. a long time yeah. ago. And it was the same things. I feel like oh my god, people are going to be spending so much more now because because mm -hmm. it just becomes so much easier. Then I think was it um, was it Domino's? I think this is a little bit of a, just a marketing thing. They had zero click uh, orders, didn't they, for a while? <laughs> that does sound right. Yeah. Like if if um, maybe someone can Google this, but I think um, like there would be a timer, and if you didn't say no, like the pizza would just arrive at your door <laughs> or something. So uh, frictionless buying, I guess, is the thing. All right. So folks are filing in. Um, hey, everyone. Uh, Mike Costillo, Ann Galladay, and Claire Conahan are all here with us today, and we're going to be talking about innovation and what this means, both for food service as well as retail, uh, plus a little bit of a specific deep dive into LTOs in the restaurant 
business and maybe what some of the best practices are that we can extract from all of that. So uh, if you could do me a huge favor, um, hit your chat button, just let everyone know where you're, where you're chatting in from. Uh, if you're just saying anything near you, great, or just say hi to all your friends and colleagues around the food industry. Um, that would be wonderful. And just keep hitting chat as the ideas come through. Now, as a reminder, I hate doing this every time, but I feel like I sometimes have to, depending on which version of Zoom you have, when you chat, you can either chat to all panelists and attendees, or sometimes it just says the word everyone, or you could just choose all panelists. Make sure you choose all panelists, attendees, or everyone, so that when you chat, everyone can see what you are saying. So say, say hi, everyone, and uh, let us know where you're coming in from. And why don't we go ahead and get started? So as a quick public service announcement, uh, we have some great new content yet again, um, recently published in Report Pro. Make sure to check this out in Report Pro. If you haven't already, uh, most, uh, most of you, um, if not the substantial majority of you, currently use Report Pro, which is fantastic. We're super excited about that. Uh, and there's some great new content we just wanted to make sure you're aware of that's in there for you right now. So there's a, um, a great sort of quick read on menu substitutions and accommodations. Um, what that actually means this is part of our Food Service Pro series. You can get to that right now. Um, there's a look at value, uh, what's happened in the past, what's going on today in the, the greater value equation, and what's coming down the pike potentially, and value obviously becomes more important with the current economic um, situation that we're in and with inflation. And then finally, uh, a really fun read on what's happening with summer 2022 trends. So I think uh, this is our last pre-summer webinar, because summer starts, I guess, next week, right? Uh, so get ready for summer and check out the summer 2022 trends. All of that's in Report Pro. And uh, Mike, this would be a pretty good segue into you to yeah. tell us what you're seeing around the world of food. Because we have a few summer trends in here and I'm losing my voice. I think I talked to way too many people at the National Restaurant Association show this weekend. So I apologize. Um, but what, to get right into it, so this is something that um, Eric, one of our colleagues, shared on our Slack channel, um, and it's been making the rounds. I saw it on CNN, I've you know, seen a number of news articles about it, but, and we've had a lot of weird burrito technology. I feel like two weeks ago, we talked about the burrito funnel, where, you know, as you ate your burrito, if the ingredients fell out, they could fall into this funnel and make a second taco. But this is our, our newest burrito technology, which is an edible tape that keeps the burrito closed together. So it's four U.S. engineering students from Johns Hopkins University developed this. It doesn't look appetizing in the picture here, but I think this is an earlier prototype because one of their rules for this edit edible tape was that it had to be clear. And so there is a newer version that's totally clear and see-through. But it is 100% edible. You basically peel the piece of tape off, you wet it, and you can stick it on any food, but the one that they kept coming up with was the burrito to keep it together. So it's a fully edible piece of tape, which actually is kind of a difficult proposition to come up with that, um, you know, something that is sticky, um, you know, only after you put it onto the food product. So I guess the, the definition of the word technology uh, <laughs> is perhaps in dispute. Like maybe this might be technology because <laughs> some new chemical or something was probably required for this, but that burrito funnel from a couple of weeks ago where you just eat into this big funnel and just, you know, organizes your stuff. Is that really technology? Um, I don't know. I thought, yes, and, and using an expanded definition, I think it is. Expanded definition. <laughs> um, this is the one that you, I, I, you weren't sure if this was real, um, but this is, uh, it's a brand new Bitcoin or a cryptocurrency that's been released. And it is pegged to what they say is the most stable, um, you know, single asset that we have in our society, which is Arizona green tea. You know, it's been a, a dollar for however many years now. So one of these coins is um, always worth one can of Arizona green tea, and you can always cash that coin in and they will send you that can of green tea. So it's a little bit tongue in cheek. So, I mean, it is real. You can't buy the coin. You can send it in. They have uh, did an uh, initial release of a thousand of them on the Ethereum blockchain, um, but it is a little bit kind of, you know, satirical and poking fun at the, um, you know, the crash that we've recently seen um, in the cryptocurrency space. If any of you haven't looked at the, the price of Terra Luna uh, stable mm -hmm. coin uh, over the last couple of weeks, you should check it out. 
like being down 99% a day, multiple days in a row is pretty remarkable. <laughs> and then this one, I think this is so interesting. If you don't follow Gastro Obscura, you absolutely should. They do such a great job. Their daily newsletter is amazing. Uh, but so Dogfish Head Brewery got together with Gastro Obscura and they came up with this beer that they're calling fermentation and gastration. Uh, it's basically the turducken of beers. Can you take everything that we would ferment in society and put it into one single beverage? And so I have to read it off because there's so much going on in here. So it is a, um, a rose scented sake, a mid-Atlantic honey and date mead, a bittersweet hard cider, a fruity muscat wine, and a rustic farmhouse ale all in this single bottle. So all of those ingredients fermented together into this single bottle. They're only doing a thousand of them. Um, and I think it's about 10% ABV. Is this one of those things where if you buy it, you just don't open it and you keep it and it's worth more? I like think 10 so, years in the future? yeah. Uh -huh. Oh, that's pretty cool. And nobody, yeah, it looks really nice. Uh, nobody's really said, you know, how delicious it is yet, so. And that people in the comments are saying it does not sound tasty. Um, <laughs> there, this is weirdly turning out to be the summer of flavored charcoals. I don't know if you saw the Kingsford charcoals where they had infused them with flavors like rosemary. Oh, so now Miller Lite is getting into the game and they've infused charcoal with actual Miller Lite. So they cook the Miller Lite down until it's a really rich concentrate. And then they actually spray the charcoal briquettes with the Miller Lite. And then when you cook over it, you get, they say, a really smoky kind of light beer flavor, um, you know, emanating from your grill. Does this feel like it's more of a sort of like a marketing campaign? A marketing thing. Or Miller Lite product, or is this really supposed to be a thing in the long run? I think it is my, I mean, it, it does come from a website, you know, it's not like something that you're going to find at your local store. The thing that everybody asks is, you know, does it actually infuse your, your food with flavor um, or is it just, you know, the scent of it or whatever? And like, I don't know, Kingsford says that their versions that have, you know, the actual like herbs and flavors in it do infuse the food with that flavor. So I guess theoretically it's possible. Does anyone make candles that smell like food, like a pizza candle or? Oh yeah, there's candle? tons of those. Yeah. And or do those smell really like the food they're supposed to be? Oh, some of them are amazing, absolutely. Like the dill pickle ones, yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is such a good idea. I don't know if anybody from Mondelez is listening, send us some of these because they sound so good. So I mean, it's just such a great example of, you know, looking at your portfolio, seeing, you know, which brands have synergy and then, you know, putting them together. So it's Ritz crackers and it's Oreo cookies coming together. You can see, you know, it has the Ritz on the one side, there's the chocolate cookie on the other side. And then in the center, it has both the peanut butter and the cream filling. So it's that salty, it's that sweet. Um, this is another one that they're only making a limited, um, you know, amount of them. Although I can see these being crazy popular and maybe making it to national shelves in the future. This, this sounds awesome. So is a right? cracker normally the same size as an Oreo? I, don't, I wonder that. I know they look so perfectly, you know, the exact same size in their picture. Yeah. What a great idea. Um, do you think that this, this would have been possible, let's say 10, 15 years ago, or do you think we're just in a different like consumer mindset where we're accepting of these Matches. Yeah, oh, I remember. I mean, Sweets and Snacks Expo is at McCormick Place this weekend, too. And yeah, 10, 15 years ago, you didn't see nearly the numbers of sweet and salty uh, snacks that you see now. Yeah, it's really cool. Okay. And then uh, these are my favorite every year. So every year we look at, you know, the fairs around the country, the, you know, big festivals around the country. And this one, uh, this actually comes from Canada. So in Calgary, they do the Calgary Stampede every year, which is both a giant kind of rodeo and Western festival. But then it's like, you know, the, um, you know, Texas State Fair, or the Minnesota State Fair that we have here. And they release all these insane foods every year that get people talking. And so I would encourage you to go to the website and look at all of them because there's something like 30 or 40 and they're all crazy. But I pulled three out that are just particularly wild and interesting. So this is the Crazy Tongue Pizza. It is vine ripened and naturally sweet crushed tomato sauce with mozzarella cheese, slow braised Alberta cow tongue, natural pineapple, caramelized onions, and a Baja Chipotle drizzle. So it's basically a pizza and it has Canadian cow tongue on it. So is, is the cow tongue or the pineapple more egregious? <laughs> I don't know. I guess it depends on your predilections. Oh, okay. 
This is my favorite one, even though the picture is not great. So this is the, the Bad Breath Lemonade. And so it's a refreshing ice cold lemonade and it has the smooth, delicious flavors of garlic and caramelized onions infused into it. Do you think that actually might be good? Like this? I don't, no, I don't. I don't think it will be good at all. And the reason I don't think it will be good is because we were at the Dot Foods conference a couple of weeks ago, and we did the theme of the conference was better together. So we did some unusual pairings, and one of the pairings we did was the watermelon with mustard that we had done on the um, webinar months and months ago. Uh, but the only mustard that we could get our hands on there was a really fancy French mustard that was infused with garlic and onion. So it was that sweet watermelon and then this garlic and onion flavor. There were some people that loved it, but uh, that was easily the most polarizing period that period that yeah. we did there. Some more Oreo. Yeah, and then this is the, the last one. This is the Oreo rice that they're doing. So they um, just take white rice and they infuse it with coconut milk and crushed up Oreos. And then you get that final Oreo to finish. So I don't know, I, this one I think could be good. Um, if you think of some of the sweet rice dishes and rice pudding and things like that, I don't think this is that crazy. That just sounds good. Yeah. Sounds good. yeah. All right, well, thank you, Mike. Um, we're gonna, you're gonna stick around with us. Uh, we're gonna shift gears a little bit and get into just some things that we think we think are going to start happening with trends or actually have been happening already. And uh, for that first look, we're going to explore some data in our flavor service. Um, as a reminder, flavor basically looks at everything you could eat, drink, every flavor, ingredient, um, you name it, health, healthy term, thousands of different things. And we ask consumers and we track over time, do they know what this is? Have they had it before? Have they had it multiple times You know, in a month? Do they love it? Do they hate it? Do they fall somewhere in between uh, on that spectrum? And it helps us sort of understand not just what's popular today, but what's gaining in popularity and where things might head. So uh, this is probably the most technical chart that we'll have here today. But we're looking at two of the metrics uh, that we set up as two different dimensions here from our flavor data. And one of them is, do consumers know what that thing is among thousands of different items? And, this, and you'll see that running across the bottom, that x-axis, do they know what it is? And then the other is, have they tried it before, ever? You know, whether it's one time or a million times, have they ever tried it? And typically you have um, a lot of things that sort of fall along, I don't know if you can see my mouse, sort of a straight line, right? The more, you know, if something uh, is known by a lot of people, it's probably more likely to be, have been tried by a lot of people. But occasionally you'll see some things that drift pretty far away from that straight line that goes from the lower bottom, lower left bottom to the upper right top, right? So we can maybe look at one example over here, which is this little dot that we put this arrow next to. This is something that lots of people know, but not so many people have actually tried. And this is a pretty obvious example, just to sort of illustrate what this might be. And that would be something like caviar, right? 80% of Americans know what caviar is, yet only 25% have actually tried it. And if you compare those two numbers, that 25 versus that 80, you get what we call a trial conversion rate. It's the ratio of people that have tried something compared to the percentage of people that have, know what that thing is. Um, but there's a second ratio too that we can produce by looking at whether people have, act, whether people have actually um, uh, grown fond of it, whether they love or like that item. And in the case of caviar, it's 13%. So 80% of people know caviar. 25% have tried it at least once, 13% say they love or like it. And that 13%, if you compare to that 25, that gets you a second conversion ratio, which is the affinity conversion. What is the ratio of people that uh, love or like something uh, versus the percentage of people that have actually tried it at some point? So caviar would be a case where uh, a lot of people know it, not many people have tried it. Uh, when people do try it about you know half the time, they go on to love or like it. Uh, you have things too that have, let's say, some polarizing effects, right? If you look at something like black licorice, here that trial conversion is higher, right? 60% of people that have actually heard of black licorice have actually gone on to try it. Uh, but, you know, only a minority, that ratio of 42%, end up becoming lovers or likers of black licorice. It tends to be one of the most more polarizing foods, along with things like liver, um, certain diet foods and whatnot. So we wanted to explore these conversion ratios a little bit further. And I think they sort of shed light on maybe where some trends uh, may be headed in the future. And I want to show you a couple of examples first. So here are a couple of things that you might find in the world of food that have a high degree of trial conversion, meaning if 
you know, uh, almost everyone that has heard of it has actually gone on to try it. And also a high affinity conversion, right? There's a high ratio of people that love or like that item compared to the percentage of people that have actually tried that item. You can look at something like burritos, right? Pretty ubiquitous, um, really high conversion ratio, 92%. Really high, really high trial conversion ratio of 92%, really high affinity conversion ratio of 85%. Makes sense, right? People, people love burritos. No one's scared of trying a burrito. Once you hear about it, you're like, I want to give this thing a shot. Then, you know, if you do try it, you tend to say, I really like this food item. Um, something like a mandarin orange, same sort, of, same sort of thing. Really high trial conversion numbers, really high affinity conversion numbers. So... These are the things that tend to be ubiquitous um, eventually and very, very popular. But you might have some other cases where let's say trial conversion is low, right? So a lot of people may have heard of it, but not many people want to try it, but the affinity conversion is high. So um, you know, if you compare the percentage of people that love or like something to the percentage of people that uh, have tried it, you get a really, really high ratio. And this might be something like uh, Wagyu would be a good example. Right, um, you have really high affinity conversion. Twenty-two percent of people ever like it. Only twenty-two percent have actually tried it. So that ratio is essentially hundred percent. But trial conversion is low. About half of America has heard of Wagyu, um, but only about twenty-two percent um, have actually gone on to try it. And often things like availability, uh, price point. These might be things that depress your trial conversion numbers, which is certainly the case of Wagyu. It's pretty expensive, right? Uh, papaya salad is another one where this is maybe not so much about price, but just sort of availability or where, or where people go. So this is an interesting one, right? Low trial conversion, you know, decent number of people have heard of it. Um, but of that, only a smaller subset, 42% have actually gone and try it. But of those that do try it, the affinity for papaya salad is actually quite high. So it's really about boosting trial to make this um, a more loved and liked food uh, across the country, right? So a little bit of a different case for papaya salad than Wagyu. But then you get to this other category, which we think is really quite important. You have some things that have really high trial conversion. If someone knows about it, they're likely to go on to try it. And they also have high affinity conversion um, you know, of people that have tried it or know about it, um, they tend to really love and like it as well. However, they're not quite ubiquitous yet because the percentage of people that are aware of the thing in the first place, the percentage of people that know it, um, just isn't fully maximized yet. And this tends to be the place where you'll, you'll find trends that have um, a lot of legs to grow, right? There's nothing really holding them back other than awareness in the marketplace. When people find out about it, they love it. Uh, when people find out about it, they, they try it. When they try it, they tend to love it, right? So what are some of the items that we might find in this really key category of high trial conversion, high affinity conversion, but awareness just isn't close to 100% yet? And you'll start seeing some things, right? So something like carne asada, really high trial conversion, really high affinity conversion, but upwards of 40% of Americans have not even heard of it just yet. So the natural conclusion is that you can sort of continue to make this more available and more, more prevalent and, um, and continue to grow awareness among consumers of something like carne asada. Um, consumption of it and love for it will only go up from there. It should scale really, really quite nicely. Uh, another example might be something like elote, right? Really high trial conversion numbers, really high affinity conversion numbers, but only one in three Americans has even heard of it at this point. So these are the types of trends you can really get behind. And if you see evidence that let's say more restaurants are starting to offer it or more retail products are starting to feature these things, there shouldn't be much consumer resistance to them going on and trying it and going on to loving it. So these are sort of the things that we tend to look at when we get a little bit more into the weeds around trend prediction, um, You know, beyond just the, is it showing up in more places type of analysis that we, we, we often do. We also look at, is, are there resistance points that would either accelerate or prevent a trend from taking off? And if you look at some of the things that we often have in this category of um, high trial conversion and high affinity conversion, but not that many people know it quite yet, uh, a lot of it tends to be things 
that are a little bit more global in nature. But I wanted to um, pivot us to a really interesting experiment that was done. And uh, this is actually, I think, a, a good example of a phenomenon we want to talk about and why it matters for food. So I think this is back in the 60s. I think this is a university of no, Oregon State University. Um, there was a psychology professor, I believe, uh, Dr. Getzinger, Getzinger, I think his name was. And he had a student that wanted to understand what would happen if I just showed up in class out of the blue with, um, with uh, you know, no forewarning to any of other classmates, essentially just wearing a black bag. Like I just become a black bag. I just sit in my chair, don't say a thing, and I'm just there. And it was really quite interesting, right? So, and then they call, and they call this person black bag now. So you, you come in, all of a sudden you see this black bag, human black bag sitting in a chair in the classroom. And in the early days, like the first time, the other students were sort of like hostile uh, toward black bag. But as the semester progressed, they started sort of warming up to it and almost had like a friendship with this uh, voiceless black bag that was literally just um, a black bag sitting in the classroom. It didn't offer any real value uh, that you could define in any way. It's just something, it was something that became more familiar to them over time. They went from um, skewing away and feeling hostile toward it to eventually almost calling black bag their friend. It became one of the gang. And, and this is perhaps one of the, the more known examples of something in psychology called the mere exposure effect, which says pretty simply, the more you are exposed to something, the more you tend to like it, right? That black bag example is awesome. Like, why would you like this weird black bag thing sitting inside of your classroom that doesn't talk or do anything, just sort of sits there, it's very bizarre. Uh, it's simply by having been exposed to it more. And this is sort of one of the classic ways that mere exposure is represented um, on a chart, which is the more you're exposed to something, the more you tend to like it simply because you've been exposed to it more, right? That black bag example. This happens in many domains of life. Music is a good one, right? I mean, I don't know, Mike, Ann, Clear. Haven't you had experiences where you turn on the radio? I don't know, people listen to the radio anymore. You turn on, you hear some song playing. You're like, yeah, this song's okay. It's not that great. But then after you hear it 20 or 30 times, you start liking it. Like that is the mere exposure effect happening. Now, there is an alternative version of this chart, which says that um, your preference can actually decline when you get to certain levels of exposure in a short period of time because it just sort of becomes played out effectively and you're overexposed. But over a long period of time, more exposure tends to mean more preference. And this holds true for things like food as well. So Dr. Rosen, uh, Dr. Paul Rosen, who's a professor of food psychology at uh, University of Pennsylvania and one of our favorite folks in, in my estimation, one of the smartest people in the, in the world of food, uh, you know, demonstrated this is true with food as well. I think he did an experiment with different juices um, uh, in, in his particular instance. But we find that we have things like acquired tastes in food. Maybe you didn't like them the first time, you didn't like them the second time, but as you're exposed to them more and more, you begin to like them, which is why getting to ubiquity, right, that last stage of a trend cycle is so important for something to really be just broadly loved and have sustaining duration. So the notion of repetition actually becomes quite important in um, what we like as people and also the foods and beverages that we tend to crave over time. You have to do it more than once. And the thing that we wanted to explore is, you know, what does this actually mean given what's happening in the world today? So if you think about the origination of trends, where they've historically started relative to food trends, it's, you know, Historically, it's primarily been in the really big cities, you know, LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, those types of places. And in particular, in the downtown areas where you have all the really cool, fancy, progressive, you know, uh, restaurants and also restaurants that feature stuff that you wouldn't normally find in other places. So, and we can see this very, very clearly with the data. You could see that all the really trendy stuff happens in those cities first and in those downtown areas first, LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, et cetera. But if you look at what's happening, Data Central, um, a few years ago, we coined a term that we call dual migration, which says basically we're seeing population shifts in the US where people are A, moving out of those tier one big cities and into tier two um, and tier three, you know, slightly smaller cities. 
And B, they're moving out from the center of the city to the suburbs or the perimeter of the city or even to rural areas. Um, and you can sort of see this having been accelerated through the COVID period. So here's some data from the government that shows you some of the counties in the US that saw the largest decline in population, LA, New York, Chicago, San Francisco, all well represented here. And then also where you saw the biggest increases uh, at the county level in population, Arizona, Texas, um, more of the inland areas of California uh, and Florida and Utah. And if you go look at states, you'll see you know Idaho and, and some others that make it onto this list as well. So people are in fact leaving those big tier one cities and moving to those tier two, tier three types of cities. So that's number one. Um, number two, people are in fact doing exactly what we said they would be likely to do. They're moving out of the middle of the cities, out of the downtown areas in the center and moving and radiating outwards to the perimeter of the city. They're radiating outwards to the suburbs. They're even radiating, radiating outwards to the rural areas that surround the city often, right? America's, uh, Americans are leaving downtown in droves. California population keeps falling, led by coastal losses while the inland areas keep growing. And you'll find headline after headline about this. And the question is, well, what's gonna happen when these people that are in these really trendy areas leave for someplace else, are they just gonna say, well, I don't like those foods and stuff anymore, or are they gonna bring their tastes with them? To us, it's pretty clear they're gonna bring their tastes with them because once you like something, you sort of like it. And to understand what this might mean for trends, we wanted to understand where restaurants actually are and how this pattern might change as that migration continues to happen. So if you look across the US, this is where you find restaurants currently. 43% of all restaurants in the US are in urban communities, 36% are in suburbs, and 20% are in rural areas. Now the question is, is this the same across all types of restaurants? Or are there certain types of restaurants that skew more urban or less urban, for instance? Um, and we can take a look. So these are the types of restaurants that are least concentrated in urban areas. So if you think about it, on the flip side of this, it means you're you know, relatively more likely to find these types of restaurants in rural communities and suburbs, right? They're not strictly urban phenomenons. Buffet restaurants, barbecue, bar and grill, steakhouse, diners, pizza places, burger places, chicken and Southern restaurants. All sort of makes sense, right? If you think about like what type of restaurant are you likely to stumble across in a you know a small town or a suburb someplace, it probably sounds like this in your head. Now, there's a flip side to this, which is well, what's the stuff that is most concentrated currently in urban areas? And if population continues to move, and that population includes both consumers as well as people that might open a restaurant, will they take those tastes and those restaurants with them into? other areas that are not just tier one cities and not just the center of a city? And we think the answer is very, very clearly yes. And to understand what broad food trends we might see in the years ahead, um, one of the first things you might wanna do is just understand, well, what's typically focused in just urban areas today? Because this is where you have the most room to grow outside of just urban areas tomorrow. And here's that list, right? These are the types of restaurants that are most heavily concentrated in just urban areas as of a week ago, or I think when we last refreshed the data. Ethiopian, Argentinian restaurants, Korean, Middle Eastern, Peruvian, Brazilian, Vietnamese, Cuban, Spanish tapas, and Indian, right? Right now, for the most part, if you wanna find one of these restaurants, you have a way better shot of finding this if you're in an urban area. But we think this is gonna start changing because the people that run these restaurants and the people that love this food are moving out of just those urban areas as part of that micro, that population migration that we talked about. Uh, but what do you all see in common between these things that are most concentrated in urban areas? Like what separates this from the last list that had barbecue and buffet and burger and pizza on it? But right? it's pretty clear that the stuff that's most concentrated in urban areas right now tend to be global in nature, right? They're foods that, you know, are inspired by or came from other countries. And we have um, a perfect storm right now that's been set up. You know, the, the stars are aligned for these foods to vastly spread in their influence in the country because the people are starting to spread. And the people that, were, that have historically been in those concentrated areas 
where you'd find this type of food, they're now spreading out to other parts of the country as well. So if we want to think about future trends, I think you know the, the big, big ticket item is global is set up to spread even faster in the, in the years ahead. Uh, and then if you want to go one layer deeper, you could actually look at some of these particular types of cuisines as well. Uh, and you can see this pretty clearly from a generational perspective too. This is from one of our keynote studies, and it shows that um, the percentage of consumers that ate globally influenced foods within the past week. Uh, and here we've actually excluded Chinese, Mexican, and Italian because they're almost like American foods in some way. So we want to look at stuff that's a little bit more, uh, you know, uh, early stage global, let's say. Like this number just keeps going up and up with each subsequent generation. So yeah, boomers, not so likely to have done it. But when you get into millennials and then certainly Gen Z, um, global consumption continues to, arrive, to rise with each subsequent generation. So between the, the, the macro force of the fact that, you know, uh, the influence of Gen Z and subsequent generations will by definition only continue to grow and that population shifts are moving out away from big cities to tier two cities and to the suburbs and rural areas, um, it's pretty clear that we're set up for an acceleration of the spread of global foods and influences. Um, so with that, uh, Claire is gonna take us through a look at just some of the things that we're seeing with global food trends in the US um, that are materializing just today. Uh, Claire? Okay, let's get to it. Okay. Uh, so what we did here, I think everyone on this call has seen our menu data before. Uh, here we just looked at things, um, this isn't everything global, these are some of the ones we think are growing the fastest, have already a good amount of penetration, so they're already found on a, a number of restaurant menus, uh, and ones that we're seeing starting to hit a variety of areas of food service and retail. Uh, and it's, it's a nice list because it has a lot of different areas, and you you will see that I did not exclude some Italian, even though that was uh, not part of the previous chart. Uh, but you see a lot of kind of fun things here. We're finally starting to see some Indian cuisine starting to, to take hold, things like butter chicken, some more approachable things there. And we see elote again, um, despite us talking about it earlier. And then the fun one here to me, because it was my introduction to Thai food, but I didn't know this is what it was um, nicknamed. My restaurant when I was little called it spicy crazy noodles, but drunken noodles or um, pod ki mao uh, would be the more traditional way of doing it. But the um, kind of more friendly way is growing on menus too. Yeah, and as you said, Claire, this is just a very small excerpt. It's a very small partial list from a very much bigger set of global things that we see trending up, but just some that we thought were interesting to talk about today. Uh, and then here we took some of those and looked in our scores database to see how they're being already done uh, at major chains as new items or limited time offers and how they're scoring. So I pulled out a couple examples. So we have, um, and I saw someone in the comments um, mentioned um, elote is often like people are like, I I'm not familiar with elote. And it's because we've all decided it's called Mexican street corn. And that's how we put it on menus when we bring it into chains. And you can see that here uh, with this Mexican street corn salad at the end. Um, and that one also features the top growing cheese, um, one of them, Cotija cheese. Uh, and then there's examples of um, Calabrian chili pepper, sambal, and then uh, the orange chicken sandwich bao, which um, seems to have scored extremely well. Uh, that's really a platform that's working for them, I think. Yeah, so Elote is a really interesting example because on the one hand, we want to build awareness and availability of Elote to get people to see what it is because we know they end up going on to often um, li liking it. Uh, but at the same time, you probably don't want to call your item elote because people aren't as familiar with it and they won't instantly react to it in some way. So what they did here, Mexican street corn, makes a, makes a ton of sense. And we saw the same thing for a long time, right? Think of the time before consumers knew what a banh mi was, right? In our uh, scores data, it was pretty clear if you called something a banh mi sandwich back then, People will turn away from it because they're like, I don't know what that is, you know, in the in the name of the item. But if you call it, you know, uh, you know, a Vietnamese sandwich or or something like that, it would tend to do better. The the guidance that we often give is if you take something that's not as well known, you probably want to put that in the description of the item to make the item more interesting and reserve the name of the item for terms that are more broadly familiar to the consumer, uh, unless you can pair it with a photo in which case that's just 
helps cut through all the uh, unknown clutter for a consumer. So this looks delicious. Yeah, and this was a, a really nice picture um, from this Desta Ethiopian grip kitchen in Atlanta, Georgia. And they have um, Miser, Tibbs, and Gomen, um, which it, it just looks nice together. And then we'll talk about in a little bit, um, one of the growing kind of themes that we're seeing is uh, if you look really tiny, like just a handful of restaurants doing it is lentil stew. And that's how we ended up with this picture is on that far left side, that's the Miser, the lentil stew that's Ethiopian. So, and then the collard greens, that's Goldman, um, the greens. And then Tibbs is just, you know, everyone needs their their kind of makes it approachable kind of grilled meat type situation. And that's what that option is. So for something like Ethiopian food, how do you make that more approachable? Because, I mean, not many consumers will know what Mies or Tibbs or, or Goldman are. Right. I mean, I think it, it's just getting down to, to not maybe not calling them, or we would always say you want to put the yeah the grilled meat at the front, and then um, called Tibbs in Ethiopia, it's actually made with all of these spices or whatever you want to do. You you lead with lentil stew, and then you explain what the flavors thereafter. Yeah, it's an interesting struggle, right? Because at the same time, if you let's say name it as something completely different, then you know some might think that you're you know dumbing down the culture or, or something at the same time. But it is very hard let's say absent a picture to get consumers to want to order this item based on just the name, if the, word, if the name is something they're not very familiar with. Uh, but this is a, a creative pursuit is, you know, how do you tweak this in a way that maximizes appeal? Uh, and if you want to talk to us about how you do with the menu items, we're really quite good at that. And we have some great lessons to share that uh, we actually might talk about some of them today. Uh, what are we seeing here, Claire? Uh, uh, and then these are some, um, this was a platform that we also looked at where we were looking at um, kind of different, this has both the spreads, um, someone in the comments mentioned stews as spreads or like the base of things. So these things might seem kind of far out when you look at a list. These are all um, earlier stage, um, like Tomb and Atar are earlier stage, and yet Trader Joe's is introducing it to the masses and Tomb this item you can find at My Jewel, and anyone who knows me knows I always complain about how inadequate My Jewel's um, food selection is. So it really tells you, because um, I'm not in the city center of Chicago, I'm like almost till you get to the suburbs. So we do not have the same stuff. And just a reminder that things can seem far out, but they might be already being featured in certain areas. So you don't want to miss that boat. And that's one that it's called, you know, there's the real name at the top, the tomb spread and sauce, and then they called it garlic aioli, and that's the part that's in blue, and that's what consumers are going to see and grab. Um, they might not even know they're trying something new, a slight twist on that. I like, too, how they really call out the spork in the uh, Walmart item to the left. With spork. Yeah, that's helpful. It's helpful. You need that for it? eating your tuna bowl on the go. That's essential. You don't want no, to be so stranded eating idea. it with yeah. your hands and showing up with like tuna hands. That'd be bad. Well, don't they put crackers or something in there? No, actually, you don't eat that with a cracker, right? You just eat that as a as a rice dish. Oh. Yeah, since that is a rice. Nope. Okay. Um, I think you said there was maybe some global things that we think are going to be worth really keeping an eye out for that might be a little bit earlier stage. Yeah, so this one I think is a little less early stage, and this is the what led to the next one. So katsu sando, and just calling sandwiches sandos, even if they very much are not, has been growing for a number of years. I, I know lots of times when I go out to eat, I'll have my friends say, is there anything different about it? They're supposed to be, but now it's just, you know, we're calling them um, sando. So the katsu sando is the classic. Um, this is kind of a weird iteration on it as it's usually pork and this looks like beef like pork would be the more traditional um but it has that you know that crispy cutlet almost um if you were more german you'd think of it as a schnitzel but um the katsu it's all a similar prep method a thin breaded meat with bread is always a, a fan favorite so that's going to continue to move so we actually had this debate i think in a previous um uh, edition of this of this webinar which is can any sandwich be called a sando and I think the answer is supposed to actually be no, even though it's we might supposed to be no, like that, that white bread, um, the, which will then the next slide I'm wearing the moment, the milk bread, that classic, like very mild milk bread with the crust cut off is like one of the core elements of it. So you're not okay. supposed to just be like, here's a bun with meat in it. It's a sando. And yet that is what we are finding also happening on menus. So if you use the white bread and you cut off the sides, you can call it a sando. Is that... I mean, I'm not More the authority on who can call things a sando, but that, that, that would be my limit. <laughs> I'm not saying you're the sando police, but I'm saying if you were, that would be the criteria you would use, uh, which takes us to the bread. Yep. 
Uh, and this is one, um, the milk bread's been growing for a number of years and it still keeps growing. Uh, we also just saw like milk bun as a reference uh, starting to uh, grow in menus too. And that's just, you know, it's taking that classic almost like wonder bread to the next level and making it homemade and even more tender from any time you add milk, it enriches a dough. And so it makes a really tender bread. So where do we see this milk bread? I mean, is it called that typically uh, in an application or are there lots yeah, of different it's, types? It's usually going to be called milk bread and it's, um, yeah, it is typically on an Asian menu though we're seeing it coming off of the Asian menu and even um, Asian restaurants of course are using it in, um, you know, those less sweet dishes that tend to be found on those dessert menus. So that's, that's where it's found. And it's what traditionally Japanese is that where it tends to be most? Yeah, that's certainly one of its like home areas, yes. And then what is this? Uh, this is one, and I might cover this in the mid-year trends too. Was it mid-year? I think it was mid-year. We keep talking about laksa and it's been like barely growing on menus and it's still barely growing, but it just makes so much sense uh, because uh, it's Malaysian. I'm like now questioning that it's Malaysian, um, but it's a uh, noodle soup. And you know, if we have ramen and that was a thing, and then we had pho and that was a thing, uh, then we need a new noodle soup because you always need a new noodle soup. Um, and we would say this would be a, a good um, way to move for it. So it's usually a coconut base, um, often has um, seafood is common, and then noodles um, is, the, is the classic. It almost looks like there's like some sort of a curry flavor or something. Yeah, it's a here. coconut curry broth um, is yeah. kind of the base. There's a lot going on. Are they all sort of crazy like this with just so many things happening in them? I mean, it's got the same kind of element as your pho and your ramen where it's a little bit, you know, top it to vary it and, and kind of build your own. So I would say a little bit so. I feel like this is super Instagrammable as a food as well, right? Just because of all the stuff going on in there. Uh, okay. And we're starting to see it show up in, in more restaurants now too, right? Not, yeah, not it's just still more. super duper tiny, um, but I think it, with everything else going on with menu trends and how we are seeing um, other Asian cuisines such as Malaysian food starting to grow, I, I think it, it's got to show. Cool. Uh, and this one's not as unique. So what's going on here? <laughs> the lentil stew made me laugh um, because I was like, lentil stew, why on earth is lentil stew growing? I love lentil stew, um, but I don't know that everybody does. Um, and this one was growing and it's because it's being used um, as a bed for things um, as French cuisine comes back, like new French restaurants will use that. You'll have, you know, your bed of lentil stew with salmon on top. And then it's also super important with plant-based trends. You're seeing uh, that particular dish growing um, as the plant-based introduction for places that don't necessarily want to do the analogs. Um, so it's growing in both Indian and Ethiopian, even if they've always had it. Um, we're now seeing those flavors coming onto other menus, not just that cuisine type. So is it fair to say that, let, let, let's say, lentil stew or, or soup is the beneficiary of just sort of being at the intersection of a lot of different unrelated trends, plant-based, certain global trends. It's found in multiple different cuisines that are all trending. Yeah, I mean, if you were to try to like pick which lentil stew is growing, I wouldn't be able to pick one for you. But yeah, once you put all those things As together, a, the overall concept. But I think a lot of consumers, that ultimately, this reduces to lentil stew, right? They may not differentiate so much between Lebanese versus Ethiopian versus something else at the end of the day. Right. Yeah, it, it's it also a great like seasonal option because it's just obscenely low cost. So you can have a nice seasonal like intro introductory appetizer for a low cost on a menu. Yeah. And you know, it's a good lesson because that is one of the things that we often look at is, you know, what are the you know different macro factors and do many of them come together all at once and influence particular foods? And this would be a good example of that. Because there's otherwise not a really strong particular reason why this is taking off, but it is because. It's getting a little bit of a lift from so many different things all at once. Uh, and uh, what are we seeing with sweets? Uh, with sweets, we're seeing uh, nostalgic sweets, which I've been an analyst here for a decade, and you're always seeing nostalgic sweets. I don't think we can ever go wrong with uh, looking at that as a theme. Um, there's some newer kind of nostalgia showing up. So cotton candy is starting to grow, um, and this one can be used, um, that's you know a classic with like shakes or ice cream, um, though it can also just be like cotton candy still on a menu. People are still doing that, um, and that's continuing to grow. 
Uh, and then this one's this one's really become more popular recently. Yeah, birthday cake is like a classic cautionary tale. When you're looking at our menu data all together, you might see birthday cake growing, and your instinct is that oh, birthday cakes are growing, and it's really that it's usage of a, as a flavor or kind of an overall build. So you know, birthday cake cookies, ice cream, etc. Was birthday cake always a flavor, or did it only recently become a flavor in the last few years? I feel like I'm seeing a, a lot more as a flavor flavor now. I think if you grew up in the 80s or 90s, you always identified the very much copyrighted sprinkle um, cake mix as birthday cake. And that overall concept, I think, has always been a bit of a flavor. We see like a lot more birthday cake ice cream, birthday cake cookies and, and stuff. That is a relatively newer phenomenon, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, certainly, yeah, the takeoff of it. But I think it's always existed just a little bit. Yeah. And so like, how do you take, you know, childhood memories and turn them into a flavor is sort of what's happened here. Uh, you know, like Oreo has done a ma magnificent job, right? It transcended being a product into becoming a flavor of its own uh, as well. So I think we're seeing more of that. Uh, and I guess this one's a little more dependent on where you're from, right? If it's nostalgic or not. Yeah, we, we were debating that. This one is nostalgic for me, certainly having grown up in, in a Mexican neighborhood. And I think it, it would very much depend, but a fried dough um, is pretty much um, always nostalgic. So whether it's churros or funnel cake or any of those, um, that's the top growing. And it isn't just churros on menus, it's being converted into a flavor. So that cinnamon, sugar, chocolate being yeah, used in a bread pudding or something. And it's notable, these are all growing in a time, you know, recently where it's been a little bit harder to eke out some growth because COVID depressed so many things. Uh, so nostalgic sweets. And then finally, uh, what do we got here? Um, you can always have to talk about things that are smothered, topped, and customized because that everybody always likes that. So we have a bunch of those on the next slide, many of which we've talked about, many of which we're probably sick of talking about, um, but they continue to grow. Yes, uh, avocado toast is still growing. We're all surprised. Um, but when you think about it, it's really about being customized and topped, even though it seems like a very different concept than a loaded tot. Um, that's kind of what this theme comes down to. So what do you think is driving the, the smothered thing, the smothered top, covered, or just over the top types of things with tons of stuff on top? I mean, everybody likes things covered with everything else. It's comforting. You don't have to pick which appetizer to get. You get to have it all at once and people get to introduce a new flavor on top of it. So if it has pulled pork and cheese and a bunch of other stuff, I might try kimchi for the first time. But, but what's, I mean, why would it be more prevalent today than let's say 10, 15 years ago, or even five years ago? Is it, is any of it related to, I don't know, coming back out of COVID and wanting to just try some extreme stuff and catch up on all the flavors you missed? Is it that everyone just gave up their diet all at once? I mean, what is the... Uh, I mean, I don't I think know once we accepted, Anna has some thoughts, I think, but once we accepted that you can eat French fries as an appetizer, I feel like the world opened up. That's true. And we it actually like saw social... exactly this, I think probably five years ago, where loaded fries started picking up uh, on menus in particular. And, and it seemed pretty clear to us, and it looks like it proved out here, that you're going to start seeing loaded, covered, smothered everything to follow suit. Uh, and it has. But uh, I actually don't know what the underlying change in human condition is that increased the desirability of these types of things, right? But uh, I, don't know. I feel like uh, social social media, right? It's like Instagramable, super visual, and then like the shareable plates, right? It's like the next level of like communal eating, right? Which is both I think COVID and pre-COVID, right? We were seeing lots of like togetherness through food, right? Yeah, it's true because it's so interesting. Look, in early parts of COVID, people were saying, I'm never going to eat off the same plate as someone else ever again. And now you're eating like all the saucy stuff out of the same bowl as someone. It's almost the exact opposite, but uh, it is growing. So, uh, oh, this one's interesting, but small. We should say this is small. Right. Yeah, so we've been talking about insects for many, many years, and I was shocked that we finally hit enough that it actually shows up in my filters. And these are actual grasshoppers. Um, Jack was like, really? Is it like grasshopper mint? I was looking only at savory for this. So these are actual grasshoppers, and it's a really good lead in to, I don't know if we're going to go with ants today or, or you have to come back next time. But this is a good example. So this item isn't nearly as approachable. Um, these are, you know, actual, you can see the um, grasshopper pieces there. Um, the black ant is 
is um, kind of a cheating example since their shtick is, you know, insect dishes, but they do have pretty pictures. So that's what we went with. Um, so and this, this is the unapproachable of, version of grasshopper. This is not approachable. And this is also an interesting one because it, it felt like to me, it falls into that gray area of plant-based. We're seeing, you know, um, halloumi and like, um, these are not necessarily plant-based insects are clearly not plants, but they're certainly more sustainable than the alternative. Um, so that's growing. But this next one is a good hint into what you would need to do to make this an LTO at a major chain. Is so what you're doing here is the grasshopper is actually the encrusting for shrimp. So it's like, um, it's not even grasshopper flour. It's like um, ground. So it's not as fine as a flour would be because I, I know that there are grasshopper and cricket you know, flowers out there. So it's got a little bit more texture and it adds even additional protein to the dish. And it certainly is much more approachable than that prior picture that Jack showed. Yeah. So this is your gateway to eating whole grasshoppers, right? Just have the flour. It's shrimp inside, you said, right? Yep, it's just shrimp. Just, you know, encrusted shrimp. Yeah. Well, um, that's a pretty good segue to LTOs and how do you make a grasshopper appetizing in an LTO? But um, Anne's going to take us through a little bit of this. Uh, Anne, what do we know about LTOs? Yeah, sure. So first, um, we can go through kind of a few things we learned from consumers in terms of their last LTO. So one thing we think about LTOs is they're much more likely to come from a chain than an independent restaurant. So, you know, chains, obviously, you know, the limited service restaurants skew towards chains. Um, and that's where we see a lot of the LTO activity. Uh, so a new thing about LTOs, yeah, to keep in mind, um, you know, I think a lot of times we can kind of conflate uh, LTOs with like sales or deals or dollar menus. Um, but when we talk to consumers, that actually wasn't the case. So we see that um, their last LTO, they're more likely to say it was actually premium price than value price. Um, so really interesting insight here that, you know, when consumers are looking at LTOs, you know, price is certainly obviously is always part of the equation, but in fact, those sort of premium, you know, special LTOs uh, are actually more likely purchased than anything that's value priced. Yeah, we'll probably see a little bit of shifting in these numbers in the months ahead, but uh, hopefully we don't shift too dramatically from these numbers. Yeah, so, and we also asked uh, what they purchased as an LTO last. So food items were twice as likely to be purchased as a beverage. Um, and the top food items, pretty intuitive things here, burgers, sandwiches, pizza, um, you know, those are all formats we talk about as being, you know, up for experimentation, right? Very easy to swap out sauces and toppings, you know, and so especially in this time of labor shortages and supply chain challenges, right? It's very easy for operators to offer LTOs with these menu categories and not have to, you know, do massive overhauls of their kitchen or purchasing. Uh, so no surprise that those are kind of the top LTOs consumers are flocking to. Um, in terms of beverages, milkshakes and dessert beverages, uh, so the most likely uh, purchased by consumers, you know, again, great format for innovation, customization, you know, pretty easy to play with and do something fun there. So no surprise. The point is you could do this in virtually any category of the menu, right, is, is open to that. Uh, but I thought this is really interesting around impulse buys. Yeah, so consumers were almost twice as likely to say that their last LTO purchase was something they bought on impulse, so it wasn't a planned purchase. Um, so definitely notable, you know, important insight here of the, you know, the value of that in-store, you know, menu boards, you know, wait staff promoting LTOs, right, that a lot of times these decisions are made kind of at the last minute, right, it's an in-the-moment purchase decision, not something consumers have planned on ahead of time. Yeah. And uh, motivations? Yeah, so then the question is, okay, so what makes them pick that LTO over a regular menu item? And, you know, over, you know, overwhelmingly top of the list here is that wanting to try something new. So, you know, again, I think this, this would have been true before COVID, but certainly after being stuck at home and, you know, eating the same things over and over, you know, something new and interesting on the menu is what's kind of causing that purchase for an LTO over the regular menu items. Yeah, and I think we just want to continue hammering away on that. So as you consider new things that you think are worth promoting as an LTO and talking about them as an LTO, there's got to be a new aspect of them for it to really land. Uh, and it's interesting that, you know, there's difference in the people's willingness to try something new depending on the category of the menu. Yeah, no, and I think this is, you know, I think if we think about this, the list is pretty intuitive, right? You know, so I think there's kind of two reasons we see desserts, appetizers, bowls and smoothies kind of at the top of the list, right? One is, you know, they tend to be kind of periphery to your meal most likely, right? So if you take that risk, you know, you're maybe not gonna be hungry because you didn't, you know, bet on your main entree perhaps, right? You're kind of 
uh, choosing these categories where it's easier to experiment, uh, more shareable too, right? So you're like, oh, well, my buddy and I are splitting the app. And so I don't like it as much, but they do. At least it's going to be eaten and enjoyed by someone. Um, and they also tend to have lower price points, right? So, you know, it's less risky to um, try something new in these other categories than some of the other ones down at the bottom of the list. Yeah, you know, seafood's such an interesting case because we see that seafood, um, individual seafood species of, of fish and shellfish tend to skew in preference toward boomers and away from millennials and Gen Z. But if you can do something different with the application or with the sauce or do something essentially new, basically, you know, the, the, the converse of the 37% here, um, that then all of a sudden it shifts to becoming more appreciated by those younger consumers. So uh, even though you're seeing, let's say, seafood at the bottom of the list, I think that's just because that's what consumers are used to seeing. And you actually see this pretty clearly in menu applications too, where there hasn't been as much interesting innovation in seafood dishes and in other categories. And I think it's screaming for it. And when you have it, the numbers start changing. Yeah, so again, like looking at what consumers say would make them more likely to order an LCO. And I'm actually gonna go slightly out of order with these. The first one, you know, jumps out something they can't get anywhere else, right? So again, everything we've been talking about today, something unique and special and exciting, you know, something rare that really, um, you know, kind of again, builds that that excitement and sense of newness. Um, and then jumping down to number three, you know, the new twist on a classic item, right? We saw the burgers, sandwiches, pizza, right? Sort of that familiar format. We certainly talk about it, data essential all the time, you know, fuse ubiquity, you know, take that familiar something and, you know, make it a little interesting and make it pop. Um, and then the second one um, definitely jumps out, uh, you know, it made sense for the time of year. So, you know, if you look at the next slide, Jack, right, um, we see seasonality, right? I feel like seasonality is, you know, nature's way of creating scarcity, which in turn sort of creates that excitement, right? Um, and so we see, you know, 61% of consumers saying that, you know, that seasonal flavors are what should distinguish an LTA from those regular menu items, right? So when developing LTOs, you want it to, you know, have specialness, excitement, a little new, a little bit familiar. And then what really makes it pop from, you know, a sort of regular menu item is that seasonality. So something that, you know, again, makes it special, makes it feel, you know, unique to that moment and that time. Yeah, I think seasonality is probably one of the most <clears throat> underappreciated and under leveraged um, things about the, that should motivate LTOs that um, the industry just doesn't do enough about, around or, or message exactly as well as um, it, it could be. Uh, and. I've shown this example many times over the last decade plus, and it still remains, uh, I think, the best example that I know of. Here's a great little place, um, I think, in, you know, wine country, California. I took this picture when we were there uh, years ago. El Molina Central, I have no idea if it's still there or not. Uh, for, you, for those of you in that area, uh, let us know in chat if you can still visit this, this place. But you go inside, and they have this amazing sign in there. It costs maybe three cents to print the sign because you just did it on your you know, own home printer. And it says, dear customers, for the next few weeks, we'll have Seville oranges, one of the necessary ingredients for Yucatan, uh, Yucatan cooking. We hope you get a chance to try some sickle pock, uh, salbutas with cochinita pork, and papazulas, the egg enchiladas, supposedly the first enchiladas made by the Mayans. It's a short season, but we think worth the wait. I end up buying some of the stuff, that pumpkin seed dip. I had zero desire to buy it, but the sign made me because it felt like it was like Ann said, it's nature's scarcity. And it really, really came through. And this promotion maybe cost three to five cents or whatever the cost of printing a single sheet of paper is. <clears throat> and to me, it's just one of the most effective things that, uh, that I've ever seen. Now, obviously it's really hard to do this at scale, um, but, I think we can all pull something from this type of a message. If you're a chain uh, chain restaurant and you have LTOs, or if you're a supplier and you're partnering with chains on on, on how to make something really appealing, think about the seasonal message. Uh, don't just use the word seasonal, but build a story around it in some way. Um, I'll be honest, I don't even know if I ended up trying that pumpkin seed dip that I bought. I think it ended up just sitting in its container. We never opened it and probably just spoiled uh, at some point but I sort of had to buy it after I saw this. Uh, it felt incredibly seasonal. So I'm sure we've all had similar you know, experiences, but think about this, You know, etch this into your brain. How do you make this a part of your LTO messaging uh, and broader LTO initiative too? So um, 
with that, there is one last piece. And if I could just maybe take us through the end, because we're so close, which is, uh, you know, operators use social media to pro promote LTOs. But I would look at that bottom number uh, even more so, which is that almost three quarters consumers say they would actually like to provide input to help restaurants and C stores create new LTOs, pull the consumer into the process some way. You'll have an instantly engaged audience that they knew that they were part of that creative process somehow too. So I don't think, I guess like, you know, someone can tweet something and, and you could say, oh yeah, we've read your tweets and here's what we came up with. You probably want something that feels um, a little bit more purposeful even than that to really get that level of engagement. So uh, just a few things that uh, we thought would be interesting around LTO. There's a lot more. Check it out in Report Pro if you have access. We have really great information in there. Uh, and we are, uh, we're past time. Okay, so in two weeks, we have another amazing episode. And it's actually some of our most popular episodes is when Mike and Renee come and share all the amazing stuff they see around the world of food. That's going to happen in two weeks, same time, June 9th, Thursday, noon central. Don't miss it. And uh, if you haven't, uh, if you're not working with someone at Data Central yet, just email us, hello at datacentral.com. We'd love to get to know you. Thank you all, and we will see you shortly.